Okay, it's taking a little bit of time to turn on. Okay, it's on. Good. All right. Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to our second lecture on BC213, the end times. We are in our in chapter one, our introduction chapter. We're just kind of laying out um, the groundwork to start looking at the end times and the sequence of events. We, previous class, we went through some examples of the Bible being, or the, or the Bible being a prophetic book and the reliability of the prophetic scriptures. What I want to do now is, we just want to read through Matthew chapter 24 and this whole chapter is is the discourse or the teaching given by the Lord Jesus. Uh, it's a long chapter, but I just want us to read through it. And then I want uh, to just um, break it down to session, to show, us, show it to us in sections saying, this is what he said, which will happen in this time period. This is what he said, which will happen in this time period. So if you break it down into the time periods that that uh, uh, we understand, then it becomes very clear for us about when certain things are going to happen. So let's begin, Matthew 24. I just, uh, you know, request different people. So it's a, it's a long chapter, it has 51 verses, um, but just different people to, you know, maybe read about five verses each and just pass it on. So each one could, Maybe read five words and we can just take turns and go through it. i read through it first quickly. Matthew 24, verses 1 to 5. Somebody could read it. Read that first, please. Matthew chapter 24, verse 1 to 5. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming? end of the end of the age. Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. Okay, somebody from, continue please, verse 6 to 10. Um, verse 6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation, and kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake and then many will be offended will betray one another and will hate one another okay was 11 to 15 then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many and because But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation speak, spoken by Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy places, whosoever reads it, whosoever, re whosoever reads, let him understand. Amen. Thank you. Next, um, 16 to 20. Somebody. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the house top not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. 
but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Verse 20. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Thank you. Verses 21 to 25, somebody. But then, uh, sorry, 21 to 25. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or there, do not believe it, for false cries and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Thank you. Was it 26 to 30, please, somebody? Was this? 26 to 30. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out, or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. <laughs> the coming of the Son of Man. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Thank you. 31 to 35, somebody. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. They will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near, so you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Thank you. 36 to 40, please, somebody. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. 41, 45. Yeah. Two women will be grinning with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch. Before you do not know on what your day Lord will come, what day your Lord will come, but understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would have not let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. When Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the Master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? Okay, last one. 46 to 51. Bless is, bless is the servant when his Lord he comes shall find 
shall find shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil evil, evil servant shall shall say in 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 his heart, my lord delays his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and to drink with with the drunkards the la the, the lord of their servants shall come in a day when he looks not for him and 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 in an hour that he he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites there shall be weeping and garnishing of the teeth thank you everyone thank you all right so this is a very very interesting chapter because you know how it starts off jesus with his disciples they are in jerusalem <laughs> jesus looks at the temple and he says i'm telling you uh, this is matthew 24 1 and 2 this temple is going to be destroyed imagine if you were sitting you know you're one of the disciples of jesus and uh, you hear him tell that this temple is going to be destroyed now this is not an ordinary temple this is um um yeah so as literally i see a note in the chat that's fine yeah uh, this is not odd this is the main temple solomon's temple and jesus is saying this temple is going to be destroyed not one stone will be left it's going to be thrown down so obviously um the disciples are saying, wow, that's a strange thing for anybody to say that this temple is going to be destroyed. So they wait till uh, they're away alone with Jesus. So they've gone to the Mount of Olives and they're with, you know, they have this personal time. And they say, come to him, Jesus. And they say, Lord, can you tell us when is this going to happen? Yeah, you said, this temple is going to be destroyed. When is going to this going to happen? When is going to be your coming? The sign of your coming? Because in their minds, they have recognized Jesus as the Messiah. It means he's the one who's going to come and rule and reign on the earth. You know, he's the one who's fulfilling the prophecies. Isaiah said the government will be upon his shoulder and uh, to the end of his government, to the increase of his government, there will be no end. So if this one, this person is going to fulfill that prophecy, which is one of the prophecies concerning the Messiah, that means he is going to have his kingdom, he's going to have his government and it's going to be so powerful and uh, there will be no end to that government. So they come into Jesus and saying, when is the sign of your coming? You are coming, you know, uh, you're going to come in power and authority and all this is going to end. So they're connecting this temple being destroyed with the coming of the Messiah, with the end of the age. So also they're asking, please tell us. Now, it's very interesting. What Jesus spoke about, he said, this temple will be destroyed. It was actually fulfilled within the next 40 years. So Jesus spoke that around AD 30, right? That's about the time when Jesus lived. AD 70, 40 years later, the Roman Emperor Titus he came to Jerusalem because there was a rebellion and all of that. And he came and the temple was destroyed. 
So what Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24 was to was actually fulfilled immediately, meaning within 40 years, literally it was fulfilled. But what Jesus spoke thereafter, that is from verse 4 onwards, goes way out into time. Things that are yet to be fulfilled. So I want us to see this, that in this one chapter, Matthew, Matthew 24, there are different timelines for different things, different timelines. The fact is, verse 2, which actually prompted the disciples asking this question, tell us when you are going to come and when will be the end of the age. That verse 2 was actually fulfilled within 40 years temple was destroyed. But the things Jesus continued to talk about, the sign of his coming and the end of the age is way out into the future. And it's all in one chapter, Matthew 24. So as we read this chapter, we must keep in mind that there are specific time periods that are actually being spoken of. And if we can see it clearly, then our understanding of the end times, end time prophecy becomes very clear. Example, we said, the time period for Matthew 24, 2 was that time itself, 20, within the first century. AD 70, fulfilled, happened. Temple is destroyed, no longer there. But now when we get into verse 4 onwards, Matthew 24, verse 4. Here's how I want you to follow with me. Jesus is talking about signs. So he talks about deception. This is from verse 4 onwards that verse 4 and 5, there will be many who's, who come to deceive people. They will say, I am the Christ, I am the Messiah. I am." There will be deception, false prophets and preachers. Verse 6, there will be wars. Verse 7, the um, nations will be fighting. There will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes. Verse 8, he says, but this is only the beginning. There's only the starting, the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of, which later on he calls, he will call it a tribulation. This is the beginning of sorrows. I mean, this is like, okay, it's like the build up, you know, example, the volcano is getting ready to burst, but it's not yet bursting. It's just building up. Then verse nine, you'll be hated by people for my name's sake. The people will be hating Believers, Christians, those who follow Jesus, there'll be betrayal, verse 10, verse 12, 11, there'll be false prophets, verse 12, there will be lawlessness, and people uh, will have no love, love will grow cold. The, the no love, no more love, there's no more compassion, verse 12. Verse 13, he who endures to the end will be saved. Verse 14 becomes very important. The gospel will be preached. To all nations, and then the end will come. So verses 4 to 14 is a build-up because he says, then the end will come. Then the end will come. So verse 4 to 14, time period, it's a preliminary, it's a build-up to the end end, the beginning of the end, then the end will come. So these are, verses 4 to 14, are precursors. They are things that are going to happen, and they'll get worse and worse, but that is still not the end. They are leading up to the beginning of the end. The key is the gospel 
but verse 14 the gospel will be preached to all the nations as a witness and then the end will come so what I want us to see is verses 4 to 14 is a preliminary time period it is not in the end but it is before the beginning of the end and the major and now we are familiar with all the all these things you know there have always been uh, false prophets and people who claim to be Christ and there have always been wars and there have always been rumors of wars and there have always been earthquakes and pestilence has always been there and you know people believers have always been persecuted in different parts of the world and there have always been false prophets and verse 12 there have always been lawlessness and and uh, it's always been there but it's like before the beginning of the end these things would be even worse than before it's worse than before and the most important thing is the gospel will be preached to all the nations and then the end will come but I want you to think about something when Jesus was speaking this he was on you know sitting maybe sitting by the Mount of Olives he was sitting with his disciples you know 12 maybe there are a few people extra we don't know they were just sitting there and at that time when Jesus was speaking in Matthew 24 the gospel the good news the message of the good news had not gone very far he had it had just gone in those districts around Jerusalem so maybe within 200 a radius of 200 miles that's it wherever Jesus had physically gone and preached that's where the gospel had gone till that time so he's sitting on the mountain uh, on the on the Mount of Olives side he's sitting and he's saying this gospel will go to all the nations Think about it. He's sitting with a few handful of disciples. And he's saying, This gospel will go to all the nations as a witness. How can it happen? There are just so few of the people there. They're sitting in some place outside Jerusalem. But Jesus is saying, This gospel will go to all the nations. And here we are today. Uh, 2000 years later and truly the gospel has gone we could say we could say almost all it has gone almost everywhere it is true that there may be some parts of the world where you know the gospel has not reached maybe certain places still have to be reached and uh, Certain communities may still have to be reached, but every continent, and perhaps we could even say every country and right, every nation has heard. It may not have gone down all the way to every community, but I think with good confidence we could say the gospel has gone to every known nation so verses 4 to 14 is this preliminary the precursor or the build up the signs that are building up towards the beginning of the end the the key is the gospel being reached to all the nations which in our we can say in our day and time is is almost completely fulfilled yes if you say in terms of communities yeah we haven't reached everybody but in terms of maybe geographical nations I think the gospel has gone to every nation so it's there then verse 15 begins 
another time period. So, because now, after Jesus, then the end will come. The key to the end, he begins by saying, when you see, verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. This is interesting. Now Jesus is quoting Daniel, which we read. Daniel, um, uh, actually we didn't read all the verses, but in Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 to 27, Daniel uh, speaks about the, in verse 27, he talks about the uh, abomination of desolation. He talks about this uh, man of peace. And, and he mentions this in several chapters. Like I said, we will, we will study Daniel verse by verse next year. But he mentions this man of peace, Daniel 9, 27, who comes, who, who sets up a peace, a covenant of peace um, for one week, that is for seven years. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And in the middle of the week, that means three and a half years, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering. He will stop the sacrifices and offering. And he will move so quickly to do abomination. So it says on the wings of abomination, wings talking about speed. He will move so quickly uh, uh, to do abomination. He will make desolate. He will just defile and destroy. And uh, so Daniel 9.27, Jesus is quoting Daniel 9. And he says, look, this is when you look for this man whom Daniel spoke about, the abomination of desolation. But remember how this, this man start? He starts by making a covenant of peace for seven years. Daniel 9.27, very clearly, seven years. So he starts as a man of peace. He makes a covenant of peace. But in the middle of the seven years is when he will perform his abomination very quickly. He will defile the temple. He will stop the sacrifices. So literally, Matthew 24, 15 is pointing us to the seven years of Daniel 9, 27. That means Matthew 24, 4 to 14 is the build-up to the seven years. Right? And then Jesus quoting, this is what will happen. Now, very interesting. In the next verse, verse 16, Jesus says, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, why is Jesus talking very specifically about Jerusalem, Judea? Because we will see that the seven years of tribulation, there is a lot of focus on Israel as a nation. And there is a lot of, uh, the, the, the seven years of tribulation has to do with Israel. Now, it doesn't mean that the whole world will not be affected. We will see in Revelation that when God is pouring out the judgments during the seven years of tribulation, the whole world is affected. But the focus is on Israel. And so Jesus is, and, and the Antichrist is going to go out all against Israel. Revelation 12, we will see it. So Jesus is talking. Look, if you are in Jerusalem, you can't even go out. So he's saying, Verse 16, if you're in Judea, run to the mountains because, you know, you will, we will read the Antichrist is going to go out, all out against the elect, meaning the believers, but more specifically again against the Jewish people. Right? And so he says, you know, pray that you don't have to run in winter or on the Sabbath. Verse 20, Matthew 24. It means, you know, the, 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 the intensity of attack against Israel as a nation is going to be so great. Pray that you don't have to run for your life in the winter, because obviously it's going to be very difficult. 
or on the Sabbath, because generally on the Sabbath they don't do anything, they don't go, you know, travel, and so on. So this is uh, verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation. So he's talking about a different time period. In verse 8, he said, the beginning of sorrows. Verse 21, then, when? When you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, that is the middle of the seven years. So the second half of the seven years, when this man of, when this abomination of desolation is standing in the temple, holy place, when he desecrates the temple, then, verse 21, there will be great tribulation. So there is the seven years we refer to as tribulation, but the second half of the seven years is great tribulation. Is everyone with me so far? Okay, because you can use you see very clearly, right? It says then there will be great tribulation. When? When you see the abomination of desolation, verse 15, standing in the holy place, in the temple then there will be great tribulation. And he says, it will be since the beginning of the world, since uh, it, it has not been seen since the beginning, of, meaning the troubles that are going to happen during the tribulation, but especially during the second half of the tribulation, is going to be so great, nobody has seen it. Right? But then he says, just for the sake of the elects. So they will, the elect is talking about believers during the tribulation. Right? And we will see in, in when, you, when you look through Revelation that there will be people who turn to the Lord. There will be people whose hearts are hardened, who turn away from God, but there will also be people who turn to the Lord, who will be killed or martyred for their faith during the tribulation. And so these people are referred to as the elect, the believers, those who turn to, turn to the Lord, during the tribulation, the days will be shortened. And uh, there will be people, even during those days, who will come and say, you know, Christ has come, Christ has come, trying to bring some hope to people, trying to deceive people, verse 23, 24. And, you know, but he says, look, the coming of the Son of Man is going to be sudden, verse 27. You know, he's not going to come slowly in the desert, you know, no. It's going to be sudden. It's going to be verse 20, so like the lightning that flashes. So Revelation 19, when John says Jesus is coming, he comes riding on a white horse and he comes to, to triumph over the Antichrist. He comes like a lightning, the Son of Man. He will come with such great power and glory. This is verse 27. Now, think about this. A lightning is very visible. It is very powerful, meaning it, it is it is like whether you like it or not, it, it is it is there, it's in your face, it is powerful, it cannot be hidden. It's not come a lightning doesn't happen in secret. It's very powerful. Meaning verse 27 is talking about the coming of the Lord, the Revelation 19 coming of Jesus Christ at the end of that great tribulation. And it's going to be so powerful. It's going to be something you cannot miss. It's not a secret coming, but it's a very visible, very powerful coming of the Son of Man. And um, verse 29, after the tribulation of those days. So once again, time period is being given to us. It's after the tribulation of those days. It is at the end of this tribulation when the moon will, will, will be darkened, the stars will fall. So that's very clear. We see in Revelation chapter 6 and also in Revelation chapter 8, these things are happening. And these things are happening during the tribulation. So during the tribulation, the, the, the cosmic, the heavens, the heavenly bodies are being darkened. and There's just tremendous things happening in the heavens, but it's all leading to the end of the tribulation. Verse 30, then the Son of Man will appear in heaven. 
that is Revelation 19 is coming as the one, the Son of Man. Right? So that's the is coming at the end of the tribulation. Right? And there will be the gathering of people of his believers from the four winds. That means the four ends of the earth. This is verse 31. So, what I want us to understand. Matthew 24 verse 2 was fulfilled within 40 years. Matthew 24, 4 to 14 is the leading up to the beginning of the tribulation, meaning the beginning of the end. It is the leading up to, it is the preliminary, the precursor, things that will happen before the tribulation begins. Matthew 24, 15 to verse 31 is the tribulation. The second half is referred to as the great tribulation. The end of that tribulation is the Son of Man coming with great power and glory to collect, to receive whoever the believers are who had been through the tribulation. Now what has not been mentioned to us is the rapture of the church, meaning the secret coming of the Son of Man for the church. Okay, so this is the build up to the tribulation, the seven years of tribulation, the end of the tribulation, how it wraps up. But like I said, we will see that the seven years has to do primarily with the Jewish people. The church is not doing things here. They will be believers because the gospel will continue to be preached during the tribulation. But the church as a whole has been taken out of the way, and you will see that in scripture as Paul explains it to us uh, in, in Thessalonians. He will explain it. Okay. So this is a time period. The rest of Matthew 24 is Jesus giving us explanations. He tells us in Matthew 24, 32 to 35, he gives us uh, one more, one exhortation. And then verses 36 to 51 is an exhortation about how to be ready for all of these things. So 32 to 35, Jesus says, look, watch out for the signs. Watch out for the signs. So example, he says, Matthew 24, 32, says, if you see the fig tree, and if the fig tree is, you know, putting out its leaves and everything, it's beginning to turn green and all that, then you know, okay, summer is coming. You know, uh, the leaves are coming out and it's getting ready. Summer is coming. So look out for the sun. Look out for the signs. Now, what is very interesting is, verse 34, he says, when you see these signs happening, what were the signs in Matthew 4, Matthew 24, 4 to 14? He's given us the signs. When you see these signs happening, all this will take place within one generation. That means this, the end of the age, the seven year period, obviously will take place within one generation. One generation will see the build-up to it and will see it happen. It'll take place. So, if we are that generation and we are seeing the signs happening, the signs of Matthew 4, 14, Matthew 24, 4 to 14 happening, then he says, look, in that generation, I'm saying if we are, I'm not saying we are, but I'm saying if we are, then everything will take place in this one generation that sees these signs beginning to happen. Because they are, they are building up to the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation, uh, the Tribulation is a seven year period. It'll happen all within that generation. So Matthew 24, 32 to 35. What 
is another thing, and this is only a side note. I'm giving it as a side note. I'm not saying it is something to emphasize on, but as a side note, many people, many, and I say many people, I mean uh, uh, scholars, Bible teachers, who who look, uh, who study Bible prophecy. Uh, they point out that the fig tree, Jesus spoke about the fig tree. Now, the, symbolically, the fig tree is, is the fig tree is symbolic or figurative of Israel as a nation. And we, we, will, look, we will mention this a little later as well. But I'm mentioning, mentioning this in passing now. The fig tree represents Israel as a nation. So, If Jesus intended verse 32 to be a pointer to Israel, when he used the picture of a fig tree, he says, if you see the fig tree blooming, know that the you know things are very close. Um, so in one sense, we take it literally. Yeah, literally he was giving an example, like how you know you see the fig tree becoming green, you know summer is come. That's literal. So the literal interpretation is, when you see all these signs of Matthew 24, 4 to 14 happening, and they're building up, becoming more and more, then you know that generation, in that generation, the rest of the things will take place. That's the literal interpretation. But if Matthew 24, 32, the fig tree is taken in a figurative sense, figuratively, the fig tree represents the nation of Israel, he seems, what, what many prof Bible scholars will interpret it as the generation that sees the fig tree becoming green, which is the nation of Israel coming together, becoming powerful, that generation will also see the fulfillment, the completion of this, the, the, you know, the, the last seven years of tribulation and the coming of the Son of Man. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, I, you know, so but that is a figurative, uh, a figurative interpretation of Matthew twenty four thirty two. Um, may not necessarily be, you know, correct, but I, I'm sharing it because it is something you would hear very often, especially when it comes to Bible prophecy. Keep that in mind. Uh, we will talk about it in a little bit more detail a little later on. And then Matthew 36, 24, 36 to 39, 38, he points to another sign. He says, you know, it is like in the days of Noah, what happened? In the days of Noah, Noah was warned. He warned the people. They didn't bother. But God took the elect out of the way, kept preserved them in the ship. Then there was tribulation poured out. And when that was over, people came back. But in the days of Noah, the reason people didn't pay attention to the preaching of Noah was they were so busy with their own things. You know, they were marrying, giving marriage and uh, eating and drinking, they didn't pay attention to the warning. But he said, look at what happened in the days of Noah. Something like that, similar to that, will be happening in this time, where even though the signs are being built up, people are not paying attention to it. They're just going on with their own life, eating and drinking and marrying and giving marriage. But then God's people will be taken out of the way, judgment will be poured out, and then people will be returned to the earth. Some Jesus gave that as an example. And so, verses 40 to 51, he says, what should our responsibility be? When you're in the end times, live responsibly. Live in a way you're accountable to your master and ready for his return anytime. Because we don't know exactly when he's coming. But you live in a state of readiness. That's the exhortation from verse 40 to 51. Okay. So if we understand uh, Matthew 24 
uh, 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 I mean, uh, what what I want to say is like uh, uh, this. This is this is how I, I understand Matthew twenty four, and it's so clear uh, uh, when you when you look at the identify the time periods that he's presenting to us, and how we can look at it, and uh, you know there are two the the these three time periods Matthew twenty four verse two, Matthew twenty four four to fourteen, Matthew twenty four fifteen to thirty one. Then the exhort uh, the exhortation that he's giving us, verse thirty two onwards till verse fifty one, is giving us exhortation. Um, if we understand that clearly, then Matthew twenty four becomes uh, easily understandable. Okay, I know we've come close to the end of this hour. Maybe we have a couple of minutes for questions, and you know, if you think about this, and if you have questions, uh, we will definitely pick it up in our class next week. Uh, any quick questions before we close? Uh, was the explanation okay? Were you following me in Matthew 24? Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. Any quick questions? I know there's not much time, but anybody has? Okay. You know, we will close here, but when we get back next week, uh, you know, you uh, if you have any questions with Matthew 24, uh, please feel free to ask. Or if you want to just go back and listen to this recording of this class and just go through Matthew 24 one more time, uh, just to see it very clearly, uh, that will be helpful. Um, because I think it's, uh, it's very beautifully put out for us uh, in Matthew 24, how the Lord Jesus explains it for us. Okay, so um, think about it, and if you have any questions, please uh, bring it up in the class uh, next week, okay? So let's close in prayer, and um, we will uh, dismiss. Somebody could close in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day, and we thank you for the words in the Bible, Lord, for the prophecies. God, you are amazing, and we stand in awe of all of your words. Mm -hmm. We stand in awe that you want us to know all of these things, Jesus. Mm -hmm. We praise you. We give you the glory, Lord. And I just give last night, Pastor, give help us to live the life that drives you help us to live in a way speak in a way and do things in a way like whether we eat or drink let it be done for your glory Jesus help us to live that responsible life Lord that we will always be ready to see you coming again and we will always uh, shine your light to others that when they see us they can see you Jesus be with us and guide us fill us with the knowledge that we need just like how you gave Samuel the knowledge. We are asking for Solomon the knowledge. We are asking for knowledge right now, Jesus. Fill us with your words. Let your words sink deeper in our heart. So, we love you in Jesus' name. Pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good break and get ready for your next class. See you soon. God bless. Bye. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.